Okay. Well, everyone's been talking about blockchain and artificial intelligence and deep learning, but I think I'm not the only one in the room who doesn't fully understand it. It's sort of like trying to get your mind around gravity or magnetism. But we have this paranoia that these issues are really, really important. It's like the next big thing, and we don't want to be left behind. It's a disruptive game changer like the internet. So the foundation has started an initiative with, to answer two questions. Number one, what is the role of blockchain and artificial intelligence in the focused ultrasound field? And number two, what role could the foundation play in this area? So we're fortunate to have a, with us Rick Hamilton to help us get started. So Rick is a distinguished engineer at Optum. Optum is a uh, part of the United, United Healthcare Organization. He's an authority on, or a thought leader in cloud computing, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Prior to working with Optum, he was at IBM for 20 years, and he was the most prolific inventor in the history of IBM. Furthermore, if you look at the whole list of inventors in terms of number of patents, he rates number 20 in the world. Where is Thomas Edison on that list? Thomas Edison is number 11, and I'm number 20, so I have some work to do. Okay, so, so we're going we're gonna to turn this into a conversation, and Rick's going to get started on the path, get us started on the path to understand where we can play in this field. So Rick, what, what is blockchain? Well, well, first of all, Neil, uh, thanks for, for having me here, and thank you all for, uh, uh, for, for welcoming me today. Uh, so I'll make it really simple. Blockchain is just a database. That's all it is. But it's a database that has some special, unique qualities. So for one, blockchain is a database that uh, uh, the stakeholders, the participants, uh, arrive at a consensus on what should be put into the database. Uh, it's a database that is uh, distributed, so all the stakeholders have their own copy. That makes it very resilient. And it's also a database uh, that allows you to see a history of all the transactions over time which means it's really great for providing audit trails and things of this nature. So uh, what we find is that you know, you've got this continually growing list of records that are all linked together in what's called blocks, and these are secured with cryptography. OK. Well, blockchain came from Bitcoin, but how does it differ from Bitcoin? So I, I have to tell you guys a, a true story. I'll make it brief. I, I was speaking at a panel last year. And it was on blockchain, and everybody just kept asking about Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. And after a while, I said, don't chase the shiny bobble. Bitcoin is not what's interesting. Blockchain is what's interesting. But blockchain is the underlying architecture that was used by Bitcoin. And uh, Bitcoin and blockchain were first described in 2008 uh, in a paper by a shadowy figure named uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. And nobody really knows who Nakamoto is or was, if it's a he or a, a her or a group. But Nakamoto wrote this paper called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And it described this underlying architecture uh, that we'll be talking about today. And the big thing that blockchain provided to the world was a way to solve the electronic cash double spend problem without a centralized authority. So think about like, your ATM card. What is it that keeps you from being able to go to ATM after ATM? and withdrawing the same $100 over and over again. It's a centralized authority of the bank. Blockchain provides a way to give this authority to the people, to the masses, to the stakeholders. And so that was the big breakthrough. But let's not talk about Bitcoin anymore, OK? No more shiny bubbles. OK, so what's so special about blockchain? Well, it's an append-only database. If, if you want to reverse an entry, uh, then you create a second entry to uh, basically undo the effects of the first. Uh, so if I have a, uh, let's say, a bank account in a normal kind of database, one day that account doesn't exist and I open it, I put $1,000 in, I pull half of it out, I pull
pull the rest of it out and I close the account. The value depends on when you look at that account. You'll see zero or a thousand or 500. But with blockchain, you see all these values. And again, this makes a great immutable audit trail, so you can find out all the things that have happened over the course of time. Um, also, I mentioned it's uh, distributed. All the stakeholders have a copy, so it's very resilient. One computer or one data center going down is not going to take down the blockchain. Uh, and uh, I think maybe perhaps a little far afield for us, but one thing that's really intellectually interesting is that blockchain provides a way to actually own a digital asset. In the past, if I had a pattern of ones and zeros, and you had the same pattern, if it's an MP3 or a health record or whatever else, we could both claim to own that. But with blockchain, you can ascribe ownership, and it gives us a way to actually say, uh, Rick owns it or Neil owns it. Great. So how is blockchain broadly used for applications like healthcare? Uh, so the first thing to recognize is uh, that a lot of the blockchain implementations we hear about are what are called permissionless. They have anonymous participants who are out there on a blockchain doing things. Uh, uh, anybody, anybody can get on there, and, and you've got people coming in under pseudonyms. And these permissionless blockchains are not what we want for healthcare. It's pretty obvious. We're not going to have anonymous participants coming in. But there's a second kind of blockchain that is very useful for healthcare and other corporate environments, and that's called permissioned. So when we have permissioned blockchains, uh, we have basically invited participants uh, who have specific roles and authority to do certain things. And this is where, uh, this is where we start seeing blockchain become very, uh, very useful for, for healthcare. Uh, the big takeaway here that I'd like to leave you with on uh, blockchain readiness or blockchain participation is that blockchain is very useful when loosely coupled organizations want to confidently share and audit data and to automate mutually beneficial processes. And I'll say that again, because that's a mouthful. But you've got loosely coupled organizations who want to confidently share and audit data and automate processes. And there aren't a whole lot of environments, there aren't a whole lot of industries that fit well in this, but there are a few. One, in, one is uh, transportation, shipping. Another is healthcare. And so we're lucky to be sitting in an area that is very well suited uh, for, uh, for blockchain, and there are a lot of use cases we can, we can prescribe uh, for healthcare blockchain. Can you provide some more color, some more details? <laughs> yeah, so in general, uh, healthcare blockchain use cases fall into three categories. Uh, the first is around uh, managing and exchanging data. This can be data of different types. It could be IoT data, you know, sensor data from the ambient environment. It could be uh, provider data. It could be uh, health records, things of this nature. So again, the first use case class is around managing and exchanging data. Uh, the second use case class is around automating processes. Uh, and a little bit of a uh, tangent here, but there's a concept in blockchains called smart contracts uh, that allow you to automate processes based on events in the real world. And you can basically take out inefficiencies using smart contracts. So what we envision is that there will be a lot of healthcare use cases around, for instance, uh, claims coordination, benefit coordination, and payment integrity. Uh, the third major class of uh, use case for healthcare for blockchain is going to be around tracking and tracing assets. These can be lab specimens, it can be uh, pharmaceuticals, or it could be durable medical equipment. So again, the three big categories, managing and exchanging data, uh, automating processes, and uh, tracking and tracing assets. Uh, the companies right now are beginning to experiment and really understand what is possible. So how do you see this playing out? Well, I see it playing out uh, in a phased approach over time. Uh, right now, as I said, companies are beginning to run proof of concepts. The early work that's happening is uh, not involving patient data, right, because of the regulatory requirements around patient data. Uh, near term, you've got these closed consortia. Again, it's a lot of experimentation that's happening. Uh, medium term, we're really envisioning getting more stakeholders involved. We'll start seeing things like claims management, prior auth, uh, prior auth uh, and improved research design. And of course, the big question is, when I say medium term, do we mean six months or six years? And we'll have to figure that out. Long term, uh, what we see is, is a, a really open and innovative ecosystem where you can start to have uh, distributed and decentralized information management, including electronic health records all kept on the blockchain. Well, can you give us any practical examples of how blockchain is used today in healthcare? So my company, Optum, uh, launched a, 
a proof of concept earlier this year, I believe it was in April, along with United Healthcare, uh, but also with Humana uh, Multiplan and uh, Quest uh, Diagnostics. And we're using uh, a common blockchain to manage and store provider data. And think about why we would do this. Uh, every payer has to have its own databases of, of provider information. And they've got to constantly update this. This is a, a, a pain and a, a workload and inefficiency we all have to undertake. By sharing this data, what are we doing? We're providing cost takeout for all the parties involved. So this is what we talk about, these loosely coupled organizations. Yes, these companies in some ways compete, but by sharing a database containing provider data, we all lower the cost and begin to look at, uh, at cost takeout uh, from the healthcare system. So you've been involved with the foundation for a number of years and you've been providing us with advice in a number of areas. What can you tell us about blockchain and focused ultrasound? I think there's, there's a tremendous number of opportunities and as you know, Neil, we're just beginning to scratch the surface in, in discussions. Uh, there's a, a lot of opportunity for people to come together for stakeholders to experiment and find new ways to, to get benefit from blockchain. Some of the ideas that we've been talking about are around manufacturers, clinical trials, uh, around contract resource organizations might get involved, uh, protocol design, patient recruitment, uh, regulatory approval, payer reimbursement. Uh, we can get into some things that research labs can do, including protocol design, uh, distribution of interim results, uh, even uh, data analysis and, and preparation, uh, publication preparation. Uh, my understanding of the, uh, of the foundation's uh, guiding mission is to foster communication, uh, collaboration, cooperation, uh, ultimately competition between manufacturer to manufacturer, research lab to research lab, and between manufacturers and research labs. And the fact is that a lot of the work that can happen in blockchain fits very nicely with this mission. Okay, so sounds terrific. What <laughs> caveats or words of advice can you provide for these stakeholders who are contemplating what, adopting what, Why do you blockchain? think there would be any caveats, Neil? I mean, everything is, is rosy and, and easy, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, first of all, don't think of blockchain as a technical solution. If you think of blockchain as a technical solution, you will fail. The fact is, yes, there's a strong technical component to it, but that's down in the noise. The way to succeed with blockchain is to think of it as a business solution. It's all about designing the right business ecosystem. Uh, because you have to ask, who are the stakeholders? And what incentives do the stakeholders have to be there? Once you design it really at this business level, you get a lot of opportunity. Uh, and so focus, first of all, on the business needs, who those stakeholders are, and what you're going to bring to the table for each. Uh, the second thing is uh, blockchain is not a hammer. Uh, it is not a one-size-fits-all tool. If a conventional database will do the job for your needs, you're better off with that uh, greater simplicity and, and cheaper cost of a conventional database. But as we talked about before, if you have these loosely coupled organizations needing to, to uh, share data, then blockchain might be right for you. Uh, the third piece of advice is that I would urge you uh, not to become discouraged thinking you're the last person to be getting onto a production blockchain. Uh, to me, this is very akin to the early days of the web. And I don't know how many of you had this memory, but in 1993, I saw my first Mosaic browser. And you know, I had been using these uh, uh, text protocols for a long time, but I saw a Mosaic browser and I thought, wow, this changes everything. But, but going in and asking somebody, what is your blockchain strategy today? It's a lot like going back to 1993 and saying, hey, what's your HTTP strategy? You, know, you recognize we're building these protocols that will change everything, but we could not have conceived of Amazon or Netflix business models in 1993. Similarly, companies worth hundreds of billions of dollars will probably be built using blockchain. Uh, but uh, right now, again, ask yourself, what applications, what use cases, what value can we derive? Begin experimenting, uh, begin, uh, begin succeeding, begin failing, and figure out what role it might play for your organization. Terrific. Well, I think we all now have a deep understanding <laughs> of blockchain. <laughs> so I, I think we better shift gears. You know, always leave a party when you're still having fun. <laughs> Let's, let's talk about artificial intelligence. 
I mean, people say that most of my intelligence is artificial, <laughs> but is there another interpretation? <laughs> well, first of all, I really don't like the term AI because AI is a very fuzzy term. And it basically means when uh, computers are doing something that previously was considered the province of humans. And so as we begin to use a technology over time, we start to call it by its proper name. If your spouse asks you, what's the weather going to be tomorrow, you don't say, let me ask the artificial intelligence. You say, let me ask Alexa. Uh, and so um, th if we use the term artificial intelligence, it's a constantly moving boundary. Uh, but today, when people talk about AI, they're mostly talking about machine learning. Uh, or that subset of machine learning called deep learning. Okay. So, let's see. So, at, at, a, at the highest level, what is machine learning? Okay. Machine learning is a term that was coined back in the 1960s. And it, it basically means that systems don't have to be explicitly programmed to deal with all inputs. Uh, systems can begin to grow, and I'll use the term learn loosely, but learn with the data, uh, and basically uh, cope with new inputs they haven't been explicitly programmed for. Uh, one important point that I think needs to be gotten across is that the term machine learning is not homogeneous. Uh, there's a wonderful book, if you're into this sort of thing, by uh, Pedro Domingos, who teaches computer science at the University of Washington called Master Algorithm, and uh, Domingos describes the five tribes of machine learning. I'll spare you details on that. Uh, one of them is deep learning, the connectionist tribe. But the thing you need to take away here is that when you talk about machine learning, there are fundamentally different approaches or different tribes to, uh, to, uh, to machine learning. OK, can you explain a bit more about how machine learning is used practically? Yeah, uh, so there we talked about five tribes. There are also uh, three fundamental approaches to machine learning. And now we're getting into some nuance, but maybe more than three, but we'll talk about three today. Uh, one is unsupervised learning. And think of unsupervised learning as uh, something you can imagine computers do very nicely and very well anyway. And that is finding patterns in data, things like cluster analysis. If you hand me a one terabyte hard drive and say, Rick, I need you to manually find the patterns in this data, I'm going to be really terrible at it but we can envision that uh, sophisticated uh, programs are able to find those patterns and provide inference for us uh, around connections, say, between uh, genetics, epigenetics, uh, environmental factors, et cetera, et cetera. A second approach beyond unsupervised is what's called supervised learning. And supervised refers to large quantities of uh, labeled data. Uh, and this is what allows, for instance, uh, uh, learners on the uh, internet to label cat pictures or what allows uh, Facebook to recognize your spouse when you upload a picture. And also it's what allows a, uh, uh, a radiology report to be automatically mined for, for pictures of, of, of tumors, for images of tumors. So that again is supervised learning. Uh, a third kind of machine learning or third form is uh, reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is where the learner chases a, a nominal goal, tries to maximize the outcome with every possible step. The area where supervised learning is making a, a high profile impact right now is in autonomous vehicles, but there are a, a, a tremendous number of other uh, applications as well. But these are different ways that machine learning really comes down to, to practical levels. Um, and so you've got the five tribes, you've got these different approaches, you've got other things like transfer learning, but I don't want to put anybody to sleep, so we'll stop there. Okay, well, why is deep learning so popular now? Okay, uh, deep learning has gotten a tremendous amount of buzz in recent years. And arguably, I mean, it's, it's, no, I would say inarguably, it's the, the newest thing and it's what's really driving ML forward. Uh, so deep learning is uh, the use of artificial neural networks and these networks can comprise layers of, uh, of neurons, and each successive layer makes broader generalizations about the data that it encounters. Uh, there was a seminal paper uh, published by Andrew Ng about 10 years ago out of Stanford. And um, in this, he made uh, the observation that graphical processing units uh, were really taking off. Uh, and so this was one of the factors, I'm uh, sorry, the graphical processing units were really great for deep learning. And so this hardware advance was uh, one of the factors that's led to this renaissance in deep learning. So we've seen companies like NVIDIA that make GPUs suddenly move from being the favorite of gaming consoles 
into the heart of deep learning. We also have, there's somebody sitting here in a Google uh, t-shirt right in the front row. We have companies like Google who've rolled out their tensor processing units, but we're seeing these hardware advances that allow us to do deep learning faster and better. A second reason that deep learning has taken off is the availability of data. You know, we've seen this explosion of data in recent years, particularly with IoT advances, data pouring out of every device we have. And uh, a lot of the deep learning techniques take a tremendous amount of data to get, uh, to get trained, and now we finally have this data. So if the first reason for the advance was hardware, the second reason is data. And the third reason is really in software architectures and software approaches. Uh, there are uh, concepts that are used to train your networks, uh, gradient descent, back propagation. And we've gotten very good at training networks quickly that allow us to, uh, to come to, to generalizations and allow for these systems to make uh, pretty accurate decisions in many cases. Well, you work for a healthcare company. How can deep learning impact healthcare? Um, I would say that it's really only limited by the human imagination. It's across the life cycle. First of all, deep learning can help us, and machine learning more broadly, can help us uh, manage well-being. When I have no uh, health condition diagnosed, it can help me maintain my health uh, to a greater degree, whether it's uh, observing my daily patterns, daily habits, and making uh, suggestions on that or, or, or other, uh, other ends. A second thing that deep learning can do is help diagnose diseases, chronic and acute conditions, really figure out what factors have become involved here and what the problem, uh, what diagnosis code should be delivered. A third thing that deep learning can help with is pinpointing treatment options based on a variety of factors, again, including environmental factors, uh, genomics, epigenetics. Uh, deep learning can help us understand the right course of action. And then finally, in something that's boring but unimportant, they can help on the back end, on the administrative side. Uh, you know, cost takeout isn't very, isn't very sexy, but at a time when healthcare is occupying about 18% of US GDP, we need ways of taking cost and inefficiencies out of the system, and deep learning can help with that as well. So, so what are the drawbacks of trying to deploy deep learning in, in healthcare? Um, so there's a, lot of, a number of drawbacks. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll mention two. Uh, one, it's very difficult sometimes to, to, to bridge that gap between conception and practical value. If you think deep learning could help us solve this problem, uh, and you start to throw resources, throw time, throw money at it, you have a decision to make. If you're not yet getting the results of uh, what you expected from this uh, exercise, is it because your feature engineering isn't up to par? Is it because you don't have the right data set? Or should you, uh, should you continue to invest money? Or should you cut and run and move on? So a lot of times what we're seeing is the application of deep learning concepts to a problem. And then you run into this brick wall and you're left saying, do I continue to chase this? Or do I move to my next use case? A second drawback or second caveat is that there's tremendous research going on in this area, but a lot of deep learning is, in effect, a black box. And so when you train a neural network, what you're doing is you're setting uh, basically pathway weights, you're setting uh, uh, values inside the network, and then you're unleashing it to solve problems. But that network cannot explain how it's arrived at certain conclusions. So for this reason, we believe that neural networks, whether it's convolutional networks or recurrent networks or GANs or whatever else, networks are going to be a, an advisory tool for a long time to come to healthcare professionals. They're not going to be making a final decision. They can give advice, but ultimately they can't explain why they made that, uh, made that decision. And particularly in a regulatory environment, this could be uh, very important and very big. Right. So from your involvement with focused ultrasound, where do you see the low-lying fruit or some easy approaches or easy use cases in focused ultrasound? So I, I think that uh, we have the opportunity for deep learning around selecting patients who are most likely to benefit from treatment. Uh, this is something that we're seeing happen uh, in other areas as well, and I think this would be well-suited for, uh, for focused ultrasound. I think also there's possibility around treatment planning, including targeting uh, dosing, guidance, and control. A lot of this also will be related to, uh, uh, to imaging and image enhancement. Great. Well, we're running short on time. What, what are your closing thoughts? What, what message do you want to leave us with? Well, the big thing I'd tell you right now is that a lot of technologies are converging, 
And the fact is uh, we don't operate in a vacuum. So we talked about the, the, the plethora of data coming from IoT devices. We're talking about you know, cloud-delivered functionality and capabilities. This is a tremendously exciting time because of the convergence of all these uh, technologies. The other thing I tell you is uh, technologists, of which I'm one, don't have all the answers, right? I can come in and I can talk about the technologies, but the way to achieve success is to get together the healthcare professionals, the business leaders, and the technologists, and bring your respective strengths together to figure out how can we apply this to solve real world problems. You know, I'm, uh, I'm excited to be working in this area on behalf of Optum and United Health Group, and I'm also part, I'm glad to be part of this extended family of, uh, of the foundation and working here to, to figure out how to uh, propel focused ultrasound. Rick, thank you so much for your discussion today, and thank you for your past efforts on behalf of the foundation. We look forward to a long, long relationship with you. Thank you, Neil. Okay. Thank you.